Today is Wednesday, October 7th, and uh, normally on this date I would not be feeding pollen supplement. But we were up in North Carolina yesterday, up in a deep into a hollow, where there was a yard of bees that really wasn't bringing in much pollen. And yeah, they did pretty good back in the summer as far as honey production, but without that uh, fall pollen from goldenrod and helianthus, they really weren't brooding up as well as I like them to before winter. So last night we moved them to a yard that's just out of, south of our shop that has a lot of goldenrod around it. And we're also going to give them some pollen supplement patties to help them rear brood on. A lot of people think that pollen supplement patties or pollen patties uh, stimulate brood rearing, but that's not entirely true. Uh, these pollen supplement patties are really a lot better at maintaining brood than they are stimulating brood rearing. So we'll also be giving them some syrup at the same time. The combination of, of thin syrup and pollen patties uh, really should get them fired up to rearing brood real well, especially with some of this natural pollen coming in off the goldenrod. We've only got about a two week window here before things are going to cool off and the natural pollen will be finished coming in. And we might persist with the pollen patties a little bit towards the end of October, even the first of November if we feel we need it. If the bees get off a real good round or two of brood, I'll be happy and then we'll stop. I really do want them to go broodless for winter because uh, we'd like to do oxalic acid vaporization in late November and early December. So. If, if at all possible, I don't like to keep the brood rearing stimulated all winter long. I think it's healthy for them to shut down for a little while, especially to allow us to do that oxalic acid. Anyway, we'll show you, show you how we do it. I think we're probably going to put a patty on almost every colony in this yard. With a double deep colony, as long as there's plenty of bees in there, we'll just uh, put the patty right in between the boxes. On the singles, we have to put it on top, of course, but we'll see what this double deep's looking like. It's a little light on bees, obviously. The first thing I want to do is uh, have a look at it and make sure they got a laying queen. And they're not starving to death, they got plenty of weight, but they just don't have very many bees. I just go right to the center looking for brood on something like this. They actually do have some pollen in them, and they do have a little brood. Looks like they might only have a brood on two frames. Yeah, that's just not enough brood. We'll give them a pollen patty and a bucket of syrup, see if we can get them to rear brood for the next two or three weeks. Lay it right here. Okay. Right. Oh yeah. That and a two-gallon bucket of syrup should fire them up pretty good. I think the colony can be fine for winter. It just needs a little stimulation right now. Single story colony will obviously treat it a little bit different because you can't put that patty in the middle. The problem with just putting a patty on the top bars and then putting a flat lid on top 
is that the beetles can get in between the lid and the patty and lay eggs and create havoc. The bees can't get up there and police that area and keep it clear of beetles. So uh, we like to either use a lid that has a rim embedded on it or, or just a separate rim to put under the flat lid. I brought examples of both of those. And we're gonna swap the lid over. You can, we've got two ways of doing this. We can either use a lid that has a rim built into it and we also have some of these false rims that we can use. Either one works. Again, we're just trying to create some space between the underside of the lid and the top of the patty so the bees can police the whole patty. And let's just use the rim in this instance, John. All right. Okay, so the, the hole for the bucket's gonna be dead center. So we'll put a half here and a half there and kind of spread the patty in two pieces. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, it's not that light. My guess is it'll get two two gallon buckets of thin syrup and it'll be ready for winter. It probably will get one more pollen patty in about 10 days to two weeks, and that should get it in really good shape for winter. When I look in this comb, I see something that uh, is kind of a red flag. I see lots of young larvae in there. They're trying to rear brood, but I don't see the big puddles of royal jelly that would be an indicator of really good nutrition. When a colony is well fed, lots of pollen coming in and fresh nectar, you'll see big puddles of uh, royal jelly under the young larvae. And this colony doesn't have a lot of that, so um, we're going to, again, we're going to feed this with a pollen patty and uh, and some thin syrup and see if we can get this colony all juiced up. Actually, there's the queen right there. I need to mark her. Um, a lot of our double deeps have a division board feeder in them. I used to use them in every double deep I owned when we were traveling a lot. I wanted every colony to have a feeder in it no matter where we were so we could feed it even if we were out of state. These days we're not traveling like that anymore so not all of my double deeps have them. In fact very few do. But these two do. Um, go ahead and get closer here Seth. I want to talk about something. One of the, this, this division board feeder is from Man Lake. It's a cap and ladder. It's got these ladders in there where the bees can go down the tubes to feed, but they can't get inside the feeder. They come with these a little these little rubber bands on them to help keep the feeder closed, but those rubber bands fatigue pretty quickly. And a lot of times you can get little gaps in here that when the feeder is full, it'll swell out and the bees can get down in there. If the bees get in there, it, it, they, a lot of them drown and it just creates the biggest mess you've ever seen. 
So it's really important to squeeze the frames over really tight against that feeder so it can't swell out. Or if you can't get the frame to hold it tight, sometimes we'll even put a stick there just to keep it from bulging out. Go ahead and fill this up, John. This particular size is a gallon and a half. They make them in one gallon and two gallon. The two gallons are bigger and they make it really tight in here. It's hard to get your frames in and out. And then if you use a one gallon, it's not quite wide enough. It, it's too wide for, for just one frame. You have the same problem as you do with a two gallon. You put nine frames with a one gallon, it's too tight. And if you only put eight frames with a one gallon, then you've got quite a big a space on the other side. So uh, we really prefer, prefer the one and a half gallons. So this colony is pretty light, so not only are we going to feed the inside feeder, but we're going to feed the top feeder too. Go ahead and get one of them white buckets. <clears throat> now I get asked occasionally, you know, why black buckets, why white buckets? Um, I started out years ago with nothing but white buckets, and they they fatigue with age. They become very brittle. This bucket is only about four years old and it's already really brittle and it broke on us. And uh, a friend of mine down in South Georgia told me that uh, the black buckets last a lot longer. And he's right. I found that they really do. But they have a problem of their own too. And that is on a hot day, a black bucket like that can really warm up. And if you don't put that on a strong colony that can absorb the excessive drip that comes out of that bucket when it warms up, it can cause trouble. So we're making sure that these black buckets go on good strong colonies so they can absorb the, uh, the drip as the bucket warms up in the morning. Um, that's the drawback of the black buckets. Except for that, I actually prefer the black buckets. But because of that, I probably will no longer purchase any more black buckets. I don't like that aspect. Um, you, you don't always have good, strong colonies to put your black buckets on, and it can be a problem. You get a good shot of that right there, Seth. When you put a bucket on, a lot of times it'll run just a little bit until it catches a vacuum. And uh, that can cause a little bit of a robbing problem. Um, the colonies in this yard aren't so weak that they won't be able to defend themselves, so I, I don't see a major issue occurring here. But if you don't fill the bucket up all the way and then turn it over, the air will, uh, the air is more elastic than the fluid. And uh, for instance, if you fill the bucket up halfway and turn it over, you'll have quite a lot of leakage before it catches a good vacuum. So it's important to fill the bucket up all the way before you turn it over. You'll have a very minimal amount of that uh, liquid coming out before it catches the vacuum. Many of the colonies that we moved in here last night are sitting on a double screen divider board. Um, we make these ourselves. It's kind of a commercial heavy duty version of a divider board. It's still got the screen, but it's mostly this HDO plywood, which is really excellent material for uh, lids and bottoms and stuff. They still get the benefit of the air coming through with these two holes. Um, they were sitting on top of colonies in the yard we moved last night. This was the perfect opportunity to split them apart and give them their own new location. So we'll actually leave them on these boards for the winter. There's nothing wrong with these things being used as a bottom board in the winter. They get a little bit of uh, extra ventilation through these holes, but it's not quite like a full-blown screened bottom board. Um, so we'll just leave those just like that until spring. All right, we got some robbing going on in this yard. Sometimes it can be kind of hard to fill a bucket when the bees are trying to get in as fast as you fill it. So a little trick we'll use is just to put a couple of puffs of smoke in the bucket and it'll keep the bees out while you fill it. When we put the buckets on, we try to pour the syrup down the hole and not 
spread it all over the lid if we can help it. And put the bucket hole, the bucket outlet right immediately over the hole in the lid. These plugs that we use in our buckets are pretty slick. Um, this one has about a dozen holes in it. It's they're one sixteenth inch holes drilled out with a dr sharp drill bit. Um, any bigger than that, and sometimes you can have a little excess leakage. I used to use buckets that had screens in them, and I like that too. But the with a screen, the bees have kind of a real open access to it and it doesn't give you the ability to meter how long it takes them to take a bucket down uh, sometimes I'm fine with them taking a bucket in just a couple days but other times I want them to take four or five or maybe even seven days to take the bucket down and these plugs make that easier to do um, sometimes we'll have three holes in them sometimes we'll have 30 just depends on how fast you want the uh, syrup to go into the colony and what you're trying to accomplish if syrup goes in fast and or thick, it's not very stimulating. But if it goes in slowly and it's thin, it has a stimulative effect. And so we can control that rate with how many holes we put in these plugs. It's so kind of a rainy day here in northeast Georgia. Bees aren't exactly feeling warm and fuzzy towards our presence today. I get tickled when people brag about working their bees without a veil or any smoke. I don't think they get along with that today here in this bee yard. Bees have been pretty unhappy to see us. We use feeding as a tool to achieve desired results. This yard is an example of that. Uh, this yard was started in May with five frame nukes. We transferred them into these single story boxes and fed them with thin syrup to stimulate comb building and brood rearing in order to get them ready to produce sourwood honey in July. And it worked. Um, these colonies were rock solid going into the sourwood flow. We had a few swarm. Feeding sucrose syrup can be highly stimulating and cause a little bit of swarming. I know some people choose to feed high fructose corn syrup for that purpose, especially in the early spring. They don't want to overstimulate their bees, and sucrose is definitely more stimulating than high fructose corn syrup. I know that feeding bees is a controversial subject, but there's one thing that's helpful to understand, and that is that honey is not the preferred diet of bees. Fresh nectar actually is. I know that sounds odd, but it's actually true. Honey is nectar that has been converted into something that can be stored without spoiling or fermenting, and we shouldn't confuse the nutritional properties in honey that we humans consider essential with the actual needs of the honeybees. Honey is nectar that has been converted into survival food. Pollen is really where the vast majority of the bee's nutrition comes from, not honey. I'm not saying that uh, honey can't be better than sugar syrup. It does have nutritional values that sugar syrup doesn't, but uh, uh, people are just a little bit confused as to where the vast majority of the nutrition comes from for bees. We've been feeding here trying to get ready for winter um, this is their second feeding. Let's see, the day's date is um, it's the 10th of October, and they're probably going to get fed again. Uh, earlier, we were feeding one-to-one -one syrup here. Uh, that would have been uh, September. The feeding here today is 1.5 parts sugar to one part water, and then when we feed them in another 10 days, we'll actually get it thicker. That'll be two parts sugar to one part water. As the weather gets colder, you have to thicken it up because uh, when the uh, days drop below 50 degrees, it really gets harder for the bees to remove the moisture in either nectar or sugar, whatever you're doing. There, there's times when honey actually isn't the best choice for survival food. Lucky in this location, we don't have that problem. 
Um, that would be dark honey, excessively dark honey that has a lot of indigestible solids, honeydew, uh, high in dextrin. And both of those can cause dysentery in bees, especially if they can't get out and fly a lot, like in far north locations. Um, my favorite time for fall feeding really begins in September, August, September, and then into October. Try not to wait till it gets cold in November. Uh, I prefer that the summer bees are doing the work of converting the thin nectar or syrup into honey for, for winter survival food. When you're mixing your sugar syrup, it really doesn't matter whether you're using weight or volume to distinguish this 1 to 1 or 1.5 to 1. Oddly enough, uh, a quart of sugar weighs pretty close to the same as a quart of water, so volume or weight, it really doesn't matter. We try to make our sugar syrup up as we need it because thin syrup especially can ferment pretty quickly. It can start to ferment in four or five days. Um, sometimes we'll add honey be healthy or a little bit of bleach to inhibit that fermentation if it's going to take us a little longer than four or five days. Oddly enough, bees can metabolize small amounts of alcohol just like we as humans can, but um, just like us, large amounts will make them sick. It can give them dysentery and just uh, really make them sick. And dysentery can be caused or aggravated by poor food and bad circumstances. It isn't a disease, and there's a lot of stuff that can cause it. that. Um, you can dilute honey and feed that back to bees, but it ferments even quicker than uh, the syrup does. So we, we really feel like feeding sucrose syrup is the best choice for what we do. Um, either, syr either sucrose syrup or thinned out honey won't ferment if you keep the temperature down below 50 degrees. Another thing to consider is that uh, a lack of a nectar flow will actually reduce the hygienic behavior in a colony and feeding thin syrup can elicit this behavior, this hygienic behavior, so feeding thin syrup is actually pretty healthy for the bees. You just have to be mindful that that thin syrup can stimulate them so much that it can cause them to swarm in the spring. You've got to kind of play, play the game right and know what you're doing. Anyway, one more feeding in this yard, and I think they'll be ready for winter. It's a good yard of bees. They made a good crop of honey. They're going to be rock solid for winter. These single-story boxes are pretty full of bees. It's a cool, rainy day, and seeing this many bees is kind of an indicator of a good, strong colony. They're in good shape. I see a couple empty spots on a couple of these pallets. I know what that's about. A lot of people don't realize, especially new beekeepers, don't realize that just because the colony swarms and produces a new queen, it's not a guarantee that it's going to not be a failure. 
you really only have about a 75% chance, maybe 80 in good circumstances, of the new queen that hatches taking over a colony, getting mated properly without getting caught by a bird or a dragonfly or something. And we had several colonies swarm in this yard, and that's, that's why we have empty spots. Um, and it's especially problematic on pallets when we have beehives on individual stands, like when they have their own separate bottom board and they're a foot or two apart, we get better mating results than we do on these pallets. On these four-way pallets, it's really more like about two-thirds than it is three-quarters. We don't do quite as well. It's a good yard of bees. Okay, so I, I believe this is one of the colonies we worked in that uh, How to Split Your Bees video. It's taken two buckets of real thin syrup. Uh, we were putting 1,000 pounds of sugar in a tote. A tote holds uh, 250 to 275 gallons, so that's pretty thin syrup. I just want to have a look at what they've done with that. There has not been any honey flow. It's been a dearth, so all the foundation drawn in this colony has been on straight sugar syrup. They're just starting to work on the last frame. That frame's about two-thirds done. That's uh, pretty close to being done. Something I like to do uh, when the bees are drawing, if they haven't done a front corner, I'll reverse the frame like that and put that corner that's not finished towards the back of the box. That encourages them to get it finished. A little bit of brood on that one, so they expanded their brood nest a little bit. Yeah, this side's even better. So they've come along on that uh, four gallons of syrup. That would have been the four frames we left there, right there. So the four frames that we were leaving behind are right here. I've got brood all the way out on that. And they've drawn that out pretty good. I'm going to reverse it like I was talking about, get that on finished corner back in the back. Anyway, so that's what you can do with sugar syrup. Um, the whole yard has been handled this way. They've all grown. They've all done nicely. Um, we're going to fill this bucket today. That'll be their third bucket of that real thin sugar syrup. Some of these behind me still have a little farther to go, so they might get another bucket before the season is over. It's, uh, let's see, it's the 4th of September. So they'll draw foundation for another couple weeks. By the time we get into late September, they won't draw foundation no matter what we do. So anything we want to get accomplished has to be done in the next two or three weeks. And then it's really just shutting it down for winter. They'll be ready, though. I'm happy with what I'm seeing here. It's good. Thanks, so. This is the last feeding of the year for this yard. 
This yard has showed up in several of my videos. It's a nuke production yard. You can see some of them have got a one gallon bucket. Some of them have got a two. Um, it's just, let's see, it's the 5th of October. If I was uh, feeding any later than this, I would feed one and a half parts sugar to one part water. We're feeding one to one today because it's early October and they still have plenty of time to remove the excess moisture. If I was feeding uh, late October into November, I'd probably do two to one. You gotta be careful not to give bees thin syrup late in the season because they need time to remove the moisture before going into winter. Once the daytime temperatures drop below 50 degrees, it's really hard for them to remove moisture. And at that time, you'd wanna give them thicker syrup. I think it's gonna be about 65 degrees today and uh, we'll have that kind of weather for a couple of weeks yet so the bees will be able to re remove moisture. That's why we're still feeding one to one. Anyway, this is the last go around. They're pretty heavy. They're in really good shape. We've checked every colony one last time to make sure it's clean right. Checked it for weight. Given it the appropriate bucket or no bucket at all in a few cases.